Defense Minister Tandi Modise says she will be launching an investigation to find out what happened to the resources allocated to the military veterans. Modise says with the resources invested to the veterans, they should be better off than they are right now. Modise was speaking on the hostage drama which unfolded last night in Irene, Pretoria. Newsroom Africa's politics editor, Sbungala, was there at the scene last night and he joins us now in, in studio. Swo, you literally bolted out to uh, the scene of the hostage uh, drama yesterday. Uh, talk to us about what led to that particular point, the inklings that you heard that said, look, there's a situation, get there. I mean, Newsroom Africa was the first to actually even arrive there. Now, Tommy, of course, uh, I got a, a tip off from one of our colleagues uh, tomorrow to say, hey, there's this uh, incident uh, playing out. And at that time, we had no verification. Um, save for a few numbers of some of the people who are supposed to have been involved and then quickly I got onto the phone and uh, contacted uh, those people who had uh, pretty much verified that there was a standoff. Uh, of course, they depended on their interpretation. But then I also needed to verify it from the official side of the ANC, rather of the ANC, but also of the government. And once I felt that we had enough information, we were able to actually break um, that story on air and be able to bring in actually the spokesperson of the disgruntled uh, war veterans and that was at that moment that we we're able to also mobilize our resources here and make sure that we are on the ground and I guess um, what assisted in this regard is that we were actually we the information that we had as to what had unfolded it was able to it was it, it enabled us to be able to uh, kind of push back because you know the normal line when people are caught in such a situation will have a denial from the government mm -hmm. but armed with the information that we had we were able to um, push back and as you saw um, from last night the fact that when we got there the police were still there all those suspects were still on the ground there was a police spokesperson who I'm sure at some moment had hoped to be incognito um, hence we had to follow him um, and try and get a, a, an interview with him which we eventually uh, got to get to understand what exactly had unfolded there and I guess the nature of uh, live TV time is that information comes in drips and drabs and you get to um, verify some aspects of this of the of the story and also tweak some of the information that you have picked up earlier and and just to show it was such a developing story uh, you know Vish was still running around you couldn't first get him the first time right because he was clearly dealing with a very urgent situation but then he did come back did you get to talk to any of the military veterans that, that were on the ground? What was their sentiment? Uh, were, they, were they angry? Were they disappointed? Where were they? In fact, fortunately, Tammy, the reason why we were able to give regular updates, even before we could get to the scene, is that even at the time that they had been rounded up, we still had access um, to some of them to get a sense of what was happening. And the uh, prevailing mood was that they pretty much had resigned themselves to the reality that they would be arrested. And I guess they knew the severity of the um, of the of the of the of their conduct. Um, I think at that point, um, our colleague Tabo was talking to Loise, and at the same time, I was talking to Loise as well to get a sense of what was um, happening at the ground. In fact, actually, at the time that the uh, special task force of the SAPS stormed into the um, into the um, into into the venue, um, he was live on air, and then at that moment, his phone um, died, and I guess that was the um, unfolding story and I guess for us also it was important to give it to treat it uh, with the seriousness that it deserves in that um, I ended up in Irene and also because we have never seen a sin like this in a post-democratic um, South Africa so um, rather in a, in a post-apartheid South Africa I meant um, where you have a minister of uh, the uh, defense held hostage with a deputy and the minister in the presidents. I mean, I see that uh, the ministers are saying that they are not embarrassed by what happened, but I'm sure they are. It is embarrassing for the government as well. I'd like you to analyze this for us for a second. In July, we were de uh, dealing with um, serious national security issues. We're dealing with that now as well. One thing that uh, Minister Tandi Modise said, um, if I may quote, she said, this reveals that South Africa is not a security heavy state. She acknowledged that. Should we be worried by statements of that nature? We actually, we shouldn't. We should be comforted um, by state of, of that nature because a militarized state is actually a dangerous state because authoritarianship actually breeds in and um, tyranny 
is synonymous with um, heavily militarized states. And also you do not want in a democracy a military that is too powerful as we've seen in other countries. I mean, there, is, uh, there are coups that happen in other countries and you suddenly have military generals taking over as presidents. Um, we saw the same happening in our, to our neighbors in Zimbabwe. I don't think we want to get to that point. But so, I think just, that so talk to me then, with that point made, how does one then secure a state? How does one have a secure state as opposed to a militarized state? Of course, the, the issue there, Tammy, is that of a, a respect for the rule of law and actually law enforcement that does uh, its job. And I guess the, it is a fair question for South Africans to ask, the, to ask and say, are we safe? If you can have mass looting on the scale that we saw in July, where we lost about 50 billion rand, um, and where the police were actually overwhelmed and had pretty much taken their hands off, and even that looting was not stopped by law enforcement, it was stopped by ordinary South Africans who stood in defense of their properties and of their of but their But is mobs. that an ideal situation? Is that Obviously. What, but do South Africans want to be taking the law into their own hands? It should not get to that point, because the reason why we're dealing with the vigilantism um, and the racial profiling that we saw in Phoenix is actually a result of a failure by the government to do its job. Hence, the, I do not uh, take seriously and I do not believe the minister when she says she's not embarrassed. It is embarrassing for the government. So if you had that incident in July, fast forward to October, you have military veterans holding the senior members of government hostage what is how much more for an ordinary South African? So I guess now this is also a moment that perhaps it was important that you had that statement, uh, that press conference by the ministers. But I do believe that at this point we do need the president or at the very least um, the deputy president. In any case, he is the leader of that presidential task team to actually come out and reassure South Africans that actually we do have a, uh, we still have a, a country where the rule of law holds supreme. I do know that they were able, the, the um, special task force of the police were able to quell that situation, but it is untenable. And, and actually it's important to allay the fears of ordinary South Africans. And then there's the issue of accountability. Over 50, about 56 or so of the military veterans uh, are taken in. We heard the minister saying that it's now in the hands of the NPA. They're not about to be withdrawing any charges, so they're washing their hands of it, and they're saying let the law take its course. Are we likely to see a rebuttal from the other military veterans in the sense that they were acting in a unison? Some happened to get caught. Look, I think there are divisions within the ranks of the military veterans. I mean, if you understand from even from the statement, the fact that you have a South African, a unified body, an umbrella body called South African Military Veterans, uh, association which is all encompassing of all the military veterans that also include military veterans that belonged to various um, liberation movements like the APLA which belonged to the which was affiliated to the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania and also Azanla which was affiliated to Azapo and then MK which was affiliated to the ANC they'd come together under that umbrella body but now what you had yesterday it looks like it's some breakaway of sorts or maybe some grouping with still within that formation who see themselves who regard themselves as the liberation struggle war veterans now those are the people that had marched to the union buildings that were also there yesterday but they're still a makeup of that SAMVA now given those divisions among themselves I think it is important also for the government to perhaps continue dealing with the recognized structures you know because once you take it outside you get situations like uh, like you have it is important to bring everyone under the fold of the South African Military Veterans Association which was there anyway so we'll, we'll have to leave it at that uh, for today Swoo, but certainly an issue that can be unpacked even further we heard the minister there Sorry. saying that uh, LSWV needs to once again reapply and be a legitimate structure but we'll leave it uh, at that I'm sure you deserve uh, a lot of rest after the running around that you did yesterday. Uh, thank you, Tammy. I'll tell my boss. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, our Swungala politics editor here at Newsroom Africa.